Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we just have a few other folks coming in. It's really great to see um, people in general, in person. <laughs> this is really, really lovely. Um, thanks for joining me this afternoon, um, where I get this opportunity to present some work in progress. Um, the talk that I'm gonna be delivering today is called Queer Medi Medievalism. Um, it derives from a combination of um, many of my different research interests. I, I do want to say there's like a little bit of a disclaimer at the beginning, which is um, we're going to be talking about the term theory <laughs> a lot, um, and I don't want folks to be afraid by that. <laughs> um, I want to say that <clears throat> one of the things that um, I try to do in regards to theoretical research is actually to historize, uh, histor historicize rather, what theoretic or what theory means, right? What theory is, what the practices surrounding theory are. Um, this derives, in fact, from my training as a medievalist, um, in which I'm focused predominantly on um, the vita contempla contemplativa, so the contemplative life, um, and I'm thinking about that as a form of theorizing, right? Um, so to think about the kinds of embodied, affective, communal practices that actually enable folks to do the intellectual or theological labor that they're attempting to do. And this is also the way that I sort of see queer theory, um, which will be the topic of focus today, as emerging as well. Part of what I'm really interested in is the bodies of people and the communities of people and the emotions that emerge out of what it means to queerly theorize. Um, so that's maybe, I think, a helpful note in terms of what it means for me to invoke the term theory. Um, so I guess what I want to say first is that the experience of living through the COVID-19 pandemic has not only afforded, but it's made really necessary a kind of rethinking once again of the ways that we talk and think about illness, pandemic, and contagion. And while the early AIDS crisis of the 80s and the 1990s isn't exactly the same as the COVID-19 pandemic, it's impossible not to draw connections between the two. The impossibility, for example, of performing funerary rites and mourning in public or communal ways, the prejudice directed um, at a constructed quote unquote risk group pitted against a quote unquote general population, um, and the recognition of a failed and inequitable healthcare system, both in the United States and globally are shared by both of these public health crises. But what I'd like to draw our attention to today is what Paula Treichler called in 1987, an epidemic of signification. So just as important as acknowledging the epidemic of a transmissible, a potentially lethal disease, Treichler Tri argues um, is the ep epidemic of meaning or signification by which she means the chaotic accumulation of interpretations of pandemic itself. So indeed, some of the examples that Treichler enumerates as the ways that AIDS was understood in the 1980s seem ready-made for a COVID-19 pandemic, right? So one of the things that Treichler does in this like really important essay is articulate some of the um, proliferating discourses around how folks are interpreting what AIDS is. And this list actually reads as if it was in reference to the COVID-19 pandemic in many ways. So for example, she notes that there's a discourse around a creation of the media, right? AIDS is a creation of the media, which is sensationalized, a minor health problem for its own profit and pleasure, right? Or another example, um, that it is a creation of the state to legitimize widespread invasion of people's lives and sexual practices. Um, or also, that it is a creation of biomedical scientists and the Centers for Disease Control to generate funding for their activities, right? These accusations, these um, what we might call myths, these um, assumptions about what AIDS was in the 1980s seem actually to fit some of the discourses around COVID-19 today. And that's one of the things that's really interests me is the ways in which discourses are produced, right, around pandemic. Um, so the point here is that AIDS generated a proliferation of discourses that had real effects on people's lives, even if they were not based on quote unquote fact. And similarly today, the proliferation of meaning assigned to COVID-19 has produced a world of multiple realities, right? There are many ways in which it seems as though folks are really living in totally different worlds according to their understanding of what the pandemic is, how the pandemic unfurled, and whether or not we're even still living within a pandemic, right? Um, so the production of realities based on often contradictory discourses of which biomedical discourse is just one, then let me to reconsider the historical and temporal biases embedded in the emergence of pandemic discourse, right? What are the ways in which time, historical periods are being marked 
by the multiple discourses that are coming out of the, the AIDS pandemic. And as a medievalist, I've been especially interested in the invocation of pre-modernity in times of plague. For to describe the AIDS pandemic as a return to pre-modern times was an all too common trope. Most famously, Susan Sontag in AIDS and Its Metaphors, published in 89, writes, AIDS reinstates something like a pre-modern experience of illness. And then she goes on to evoke AIDS as pre-modernity three more times in her meditation. In the 1997 book, Policing Desire, Simon Watney offers another theoretical uh, turn towards the past when he writes that AIDS takes us back to the pre-modern world with disease restored to its ancient theological status as punishment. And even Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, eerily prescient of the coming pandemic of AIDS, write of viruses in general in 1980, quote, we form a rhizome with our viruses, or rather our viruses cause us to form a rhizome with other animals. As Francois Jacob says, transfers of genetic material by viruses, fusions of cells originating in other species, have results um, analogous to those of the abominable couplings dear to antiquity and the Middle Ages, end quote. So HIV is not only microbially pathogenic, but it also seems that it is temporally pathogenic as well. The infection of postmodernity by premodernity, however, simultaneously contracts time in its expansion towards the past. So not only have some gay men, um, quote, responded to the threat of AIDS by rethinking the conventional emphasis on longevity and futurity, as Jack Halberstam explains, this rethinking of contracted time implicates the medieval. So even the United Nations' 2004 Human Development Index reported figures of life ex expectancy, quote, unseen since the early medieval periods, right, end quote. As, my, as might be obvious, citations of the me medieval are often aligned with a simultaneous devaluation of premodernity and homosexuality, effectively foreclosing a turn to the past by casting it as pathogenic. This is what Andrew Sullivan's 1996 New York Times Magazine article, When Plagues End Effects, for example. But how might premodernity be reappropriated for queer projects? How can it serve as a resource right, for these political ends? This project, my own project, emerges out of an observation that particular readings and citations of Christian mysticism persist in queer writing during the AIDS pandemic. We see this most obviously, for example, in Juan Goytisolo's novel, The Virtues of the Solitary Bird, published in 1988, wherein Goytisolo aligns the figure of a quarantined man dying of AIDS-related causes with the Spanish mystic, John of the Cross. Or, for example, in Robert Gluck's 1994 novel, Marjorie Kemp, which offers a queer reading of the book of Marjorie Kemp. But the explicit and implicit citation of pre-modern tropes and figures also extends into the domain of queer theory, which will be my focus today. I want to talk about the concept of ecstasy, or um, in the French, jouissance. Jouissance is going to be a term that I'm going to be using a lot today, um, not least because it occupies a really important role in one dominant thread of queer theory's history, namely the development of what's called the antisocial thesis. And we'll get to a sort of explanation of what that antisocial thesis um, is. So I'm especially interested in a version of ecstasy that brings together pleasure and pain. So I want to also hold on to ecstasy as not fully blissful, but something that actually brings together both pleasure and pain because of some of the problems that I see with a particular formulation of ecstasy. Um, so in what follows, I'm going to make three movements. I'm first going to remind us of a very <laughs> confusing, um, the, the very confusing centrality of the term jouissance in a pretty difficult essay by Leo Bersani um, in which the antisocial thesis is articulated. This essay is called Is the Rectum a Grave? So we'll begin with some passages from Is the Rectum a Grave? And then I want to turn to, um, we're going to do some time traveling. We're going to go to the 13th century um, and turn to a 13th century Beguine and Dutch mystic, Hadevik of Brabant, um, in order to elaborate the relationship between um, what's called apophatic or ineffable ecstasy and the rhythm of medieval Christian devotion. <clears throat> and then finally, I'll close with an intervention into the history of queer jouissance from the site of what is known as queer of color critique, right? A version of queer theory that takes seriously the intersection of race and ethnicity. What I hope to show is that to read contemporary formulations of jouissance with medieval mysticism makes possible a more nuanced understanding of what this concept can do for queer theoretical and political projects. Okay? So we're going to be talking here about the political resource of the concept of jouissance or ecstasy. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Bersani's essay, Is the Rectum a Grave? Bersani's essay, first published in the journal 
October in 1988 is perhaps one of the most complicated and confounding texts in queer theory, not least because it seems to want to offer a particular kind of queer ethic and politic, and it's not always very clear what that kind of ethic and politic is. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the confusion around the term jouissance. Does this text off actually offer an ethic? And if so, is the sexual ethic that is conditioned by the AIDS crisis in particular because that is the time period out of which this piece is emerging? Is this a gay male and more specifically a white middle, upper middle class uh, sexual ethic as well? Um, or is it applicable outside of the positionality of the author who is writing this particular text? These are some of the questions that arise in response to the essay. But I want to add here the question, what is jouissance, and how does it figure in relationship to Bersani's analysis of gay male sex? Right? So Bersani mentions jouissance in two really important moments in this essay. And the first, move, the first citation, he moves away from an understanding of sex as a consolidation of what he calls psychic tumescence, right? that sex is something that builds up the subject. It makes you feel stronger and bigger, um, and that you come together in community. right? You literally have bodies, two or more, coming together. And what he's trying to do is actually offer a version of sex that is not understood as such. right? Um, so what he attempts to do is shift angles away from a history of male sexual domination and control and argues for the value of powerlessness and loss of control emblematized in the sex act. So um, he explains, turning to Freud, um, this particular passage. I want to read this together with folks. Um, so as he explained, Freud suggests not only the irrelevance of the object in sexuality, but also, and even more radically, a shattering of the psychic structures themselves that are the precondition for the very establishment of a relation to others. In that curiously insistent, if intermittent, attempt to get at the essence of sexual pleasure, Freud keeps returning to a line of speculation in which the opposition between pleasure and pain becomes irrelevant, in which the sexual emerges as the jouissance of exploded limits, as the ecstatic suffering into which the human organism momentarily plunges when it is pressed beyond a certain threshold of endurance, right? So this is the first citation of the term jouissance in this essay. <coughs> but jouissance here isn't just orgasm, right? It's what, that's one way of translating the French term jouissance. Um, although, of course, it also is <laughs> orgasm at the same time. It's more importantly the coupling of pleasure and pain, and specifically the shattering of the ego, right? So indeed, Bersani couches the citation of jouissance within two framing references to Georges Bataille in this next passage, who, according to Bersani, formulates a notion of jouissance of exploded limits that is shared by both mystical experience and human sexuality. So we get this introduction of jouissance as the intersection of both pleasure and pain vis-a-vis -a, -vis a reading of Freud. And then he returns to jouissance vis-a-vis -a, -vis a reading of Georges Bataille, who's instrumental in the sort of history of thinking this particular concept. Um, and in turning to Bataille, we see even a greater emphasis on self-shattering and um, disavowal. So this passage reads, um, if sexuality is socially dysfunctional in that it brings people together only to plunge them into a self-shattering and solipsistic jouissance that drives them apart, it could also be thought of as our primary hygienic practice of nonviolence. Gay men's obsession with sex, far from being denied, should be celebrated not because of its communal virtues, not because of its subversive potential for parodies of machismo, not because it offers a model of genuine pluralism to a society that at once celebrates and punishes pluralism, but rather because it never stops representing the internalized phallic male as an infinitely loved object of sacrifice. Male homosexuality advertises the risk of the sexual itself as the risk of self-dismissal, of losing sight of the self, and in so doing, it proposes and dangerously represents jouissance as a mode of escasis, right? There are a number of things that we see here. This is a very complicated passage, but one of the things that we see is a continuation of the emphasis on self-shattering in jouissance, and specifically, we're thinking here, again, of uh, the way in which a formulation of jouissance or ecstasy undoes what we might call 
the sovereign subject, right? A subject who thinks of themselves um, as self-willing, as solid, right, as grand. Um, and what Bersani is suggesting is that in the sex act, um, what we in fact have is a shattering of that sovereignty, right? We lose control, um, and, it's, and, it's, and th that's actually a good thing, right? Because in losing control of the notion of sovereignty, we're also letting go of all the ways in which patriarchal forms of domination and power are embedded in certain formulations of sovereignty in the first place, okay? So once again, Bersani highlights the Jusson's capacity to shatter the self, and suggests that gay male sex, right, specifically, exemplifies the socially dysfunctional aspect of sex. Um, and dysfunctional not in a pathological way, right, um, but dysfunctional insofar as it is challenging what functions or what is operative. But the social dysfunction is in fact for Bersani to be lauded because insofar as it drives sex partners apart, it undoes any kind of relationality, which as a consequence undoes the possibility of social mastery aggression and violence as well. So this is what he means by our primary hygienic practice of nonviolence. Ultimately then, gay male sex offers the possibility of recognizing that sexuality is not about romantic coupling or social power, it is the psychic investment in a phallic fantasy that renders it so. Instead, gay male sex offers a way of seeing sex as the repeated capacity to kill the fantasy of a phallic ego through its embrace of jouissance as self-dissolution. Okay. Thus, Bersani is able to argue that sex is anti-communal, anti-egalitarian, anti-nurturing, anti-loving, and it is this claim that is the basis of what we call the anti-social thesis in queer theory. Okay. While Bersani cites Bataille explicitly, and also Freud in these citations of the term jouissance, he also is drawing significantly from Jacques Lacan's formulation of jouissance as well. Most obviously, he transposes onto the sex act an argument that Lacan makes about the male and female speaking positions. As Lacan explains, the male speaking subject retains a fantasy of subjective plenitude because of its investment in the phallus, while the female speaking position has access to a non-phallic jouissance, a feminine jouissance that shatters any aspirations towards subjective wholeness. And it's important that Lacan denominates these sites speaking positions because as he argues, anyone can actually occupy either site independent of their, their sex. So following Lacan then, Bersani in aligning gay male receptive sex, that is an essay about, you know, this is an essay about bottoming <laughs> um, after all, with the feminine receptive sex position, um, to suggest that anyone independent of general configuration or gender identity can gain access to the self-shattering capacity of sex. Gay male sex or bottoming merely advertises this capacity the most saliently. So as Bersani puts it, neither sex has exclusive rights to the practice of sex as self-hyperbole um, or as self-shattering for that matter. And so both Lacan and Bataille, the names that I've sort of referenced already in addition to Freud, are important here for another reason, right? Um, for those unfamiliar with these figures, both Bataille and um, Lacan are important 20th century French thinkers. Um, Bataille and Lacan have a very fraught personal relationship um, as well that, uh, that is uh, um, in part because of their sort of like overlapping romances. Um, the fact that Lacan actually ends up, I think, uh, moving into Bataille's home. Um, the fact that like the plaque um, in um, Lacan's home um, it says that this is Lacan's home and Bataille is no, not mentioned in whatsoever. There's a whole sort of like <laughs> history of these two um, that involves a lot of academic gossip. Needless to say, the, <laughs> the important part of this um, for, for my talk today is that both Bataille and Lacan are really interested in this term jouissance. Um, and in fact, um, many of the ways in which Lacan formulates jouissance come from um, the work that Bataille does in many of his anthropological, sociological, economic essays as well. Um, but the other thing that is important about both of these thinkers is that they're both readers of Christian mystical literature. Um, we have, for example, um, in Bataille, 
Bataille reads many Christian mystical thinkers. I think most prominently Margaret Ebner, Angela Foligno, for example. Um, but then in Lacan, we get an attention specifically to Teresa of Avila, Hadevik of Brabant, and then also John of the Cross. So both of these thinkers are, are invested in thinking across um, historical periods in order to work out this sort of this concept of jouissance, which is to say that the concept of jouissance that they end up with is one that is grounded in a sort of longer intellectual history related to the Christian tradition, right? Um, so I wanted to maybe just sort of uh, talk a little bit about um, a characterization that is probably quite um, known to folks in the room of Christian mystical ecstasy, which is um, Bernini's statue, um, The Ecstasy of St. Teresa, right? Um, and I think this is perhaps one of the most famous images um, of Christian mysticism, probably in Western Europe and also in the United States as well. Um, what we see here is a depiction of a moment of ecstasy um, from the life of St. Teresa. Um, and maybe what I'll do is read a quotation from that particular moment to sort of understand the way in which this statue is attempting to um, you know, evoke this particular account of mystical ecstasy. So Teresa writes, for example, that I saw in his hand, right, and this is an angel, a long spear of gold, and at the iron's point, there seemed to be a little fire. He appeared to me to be thrusting it at times into my heart and to pierce my very entrails. When he drew it out, he seemed to draw them out also and to leave me all on fire with a great love of God. The pain was so great that it made me moan, and yet so surpassing was the sweetness of this excessive pain that I could not wish to be rid of it. The soul is satisfied now with nothing less than God. The pain is not bodily, but spiritual, though the body has its share in it. Um, it is um, caressing of love so sweet, which now takes place between the soul and God, that I pray God of his goodness to make him experience it, who may think that I am lying. Okay. So a few things to note with that particular passage and description of mystical ecstasy. Once again, we see the intersection of pain and pleasure. Although for Teresa, the pain is sort of, um, it's surpassed because of the sweetness of the pleasure, right? That's the way that she describes it. The other thing that you might note, of course, is the intermingling of both spiritual and erotic language, right? The fact that she moans, the ways in which she is discussing penetration of her entrails, um, the combination of both pleasure and pain. Um, and so this is the version of ecstasy that we end up getting um, from this particular genealogy. And it's one that, and this is maybe a kind of side note, I'm very interested in thinking about how um, maybe sort of um, ekphrastic attempts to depict ecstasy, ecstasy, both in sculpture, photography, painting, et cetera, in images basically, um, all sort of do similar work, right? Combine the pleasure with the painful, which we of course see in this statue. This statue then of, of course becomes the cover image that's used both um, in Georges Bataille's um, book, Eroticism, and then also the seminar of Jacques Lacan's that is published as Encore, um, right, which is the essay, or rather the series of lectures in which he actually formulates a notion of what he calls women's jouissance through his reading of Christian mystics, right? So it is re really sort of fascinating to see that this particular statue takes up a, an important position um, in the visual culture, right, around representing ecstasy. Um, so so, so, so that's what I want to say about maybe Bersani for now. We'll return to Bersani, but I want to extend this conversation about uh, Christian mysticism by thinking a little bit about a specific um, mystic here, Hadevik of Brabant, especially because for Lacan, Hadevik is exemplary, right, of what it means to experience something like women's jouissance. <laughs> so what I wanted to suggest in turning briefly to Hadevik is that certain aspects of mystical experience are missed by a tendency in 20th century citations of mystical texts to overvalue the moment of mystical union with God, the moment of ecstasy or of jouissance, right? One of the things that we see even in the sort of visual representations of ecstasy is what we are being shown is that particular unitive moment of ecstasy. And part of what I am curious, um, as I sort of gestured to at the beginning of my talk, is the fact that for me, um, 
I want to focus on maybe the ways in which these particular moments are them themselves supported by um, schemes of ritual practice, right? Um, how is it that spiritual practices repeated over and over again um, enable the production of something like ecstasy? Um, and those things are oftentimes forgotten because of an overvaluation of the teleological nature of ecstasy, that you have this sort of unitive moment that is amazing, and then you sort of forget everything else that comes before it. So I want to talk about a little bit some of the stuff that comes before. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so let's see. By focusing on a teleological notion of mysticism, these thinkers tend to miss the repetitive and circular temporality that organizes the very devotional practices out of which mystical experience putatively arises. And so my, for my purposes, I turn to the divine office in order to explain how even scenes of mystical ecstasy are themselves, themselves conditioned by affective, embodied, and especially communal forms of devotion. Um, for those unfamiliar with um, what I'm calling the divine office, what I'm talking about here is a particular liturgical practice. Um, and I'll, I'll use the rule of Benedict or the rule that is followed by Benedictine monks and nuns as an example here. Um, but it is essentially um, the, the enjoyment by a rule of life, right? Um, a monk or a nun takes vows, they accept to live by a rule of life. And for Benedictines, for example, part of the agreement to live a rule of, to live by the rule of Benedict is to also participate in the divine office. For the Benedictines, for example, this means that the monks and the nuns will essentially memorize by heart the entire book of Psalms. They will come together as a community um, eight times a day, and they will sing or recite parts of the Psalms and essentially get through the entire book of Psalms um, over either a one week or a two week period, depending on the sort of organization of the sort of Psalm um, differences. So, so it's a sort of fascinating um, uh, practice that really um, shapes not only the sort of spiritual, but also the physical and emotional lives of these monks and nuns. In many ways, you th we might even think of the Psalms as the kind of affective um, inventory that is available, right, for monks and nuns. Um, as, as earlier Christian writers say, the Psalms actually make available all possible feelings or experiences that one might have in their life. And so what that means is that they're training a very particular set of emotions in order ultimately to you know, focus attention on the real task at hand, which is praying in order to love God, right? So, so that's sort of the way that which, in which you configure this. But part of what I want to draw attention to is the way that these repetitive practices, which we might in modern terms think of as highly monotonous, are actually what enable the emergence of something that we oftentimes think of as quite spontaneous, right? Like mystical ecstasy. And so it's actually these things coming together um, that, 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 that is of interest for me here. So while Hadovic is, is not a part of any order, right? I mentioned that she is what is called a Beguin. So she is someone who lives what we call a semi-monastic life. Um, so though she does not take orders, she lives as if according to a rule um, and does engage in many of the sort of liturgical practices as well. Um, as a Beguin, she adheres right to a sort of version of monasticism without taking vows. Um, and so what this means is that her life um, is in many ways just as structured around the divine office as those who are living in a monastery or a convent. And this is especially evident in um, the series of visions that we have of Hadovic. I'll step back and say a little bit about this particular figure because she is a, a, a very confusing but fascinating figure. Um, we actually have in uh, Hadovic's complete works um, a collection of visions we have letters that she has written, which sort of in, seem to indicate that she had a leadership role in um, her community. Um, we also have a series of different types of poems. Um, one of the difficulties with the manuscript tradition is that it does seem to be the case that um, a s particular set of these poems are not of the same order or of the same tone as the other poems. And so there is a hypothesis that the texts that we think of as authored by a singular figure, Hadovic, um, are actually authored by two figures, Hadovic I and Hadovic II. Um, neither of these hypotheses is fully provable, um, but it is certainly true that there is there are different qualities and characteristics um, and emphases in the poetic tradition that, um, that, is, that this sort of complete works is a part of. 
Um, but aside from that, we don't really know much more about this particular figure. We know that she was writing in the 13th century. We know that she seemed to have a leadership position. Um, and then, of course, we have her text, right? So, so I want to talk a little bit about the visions today and a particularly important moment in her visions that ends up being cited over and over again in contemporary scholarship on the medieval body. <coughs> so this vision is, or rather this moment, um, is set within what is known as uh, vision eight, seven and eight, which together actually make up one particular vision. Um, and this vision is titled um, like on the Eucharist, um, and it is basically an account of her taking communion. Um, but I want to, let's see, um, maybe set this up by saying, by, by, by quoting the fact that she begins this vision by saying, on a certain Pentecost Sunday, I had a vision at dawn Matins were being sung in the church, and I was present. So like all of Hadevik's other visions, the vision begins with a reference to the liturgical feast during which the events transpire, right? So a reference to, again, the divine office. She also specifies that the vision takes place during the particular liturgical hour of Matins, and this rhetorical move both authorizes her text, but more importantly demonstrates the significance of the affective and sensory training that take place through liturgical performance, especially on feast days and particularly through the recitation of the Psalms. So after recounting her feeling of despair and dissatisfaction of her unfulfilled love for God, um, articulated in particularly embodied language, she talks about the breaking of her bones and of the bursting of her blood vessels and the bursting of her heart um, so as to give us a really um, you know, a uh, fantastical image of what it means to be lovesick for God, essentially. Hadovic then describes how Christ finally comes to her in a series of mutating forms, right? So we, we get this eagle that turns into a child and then turns into a man, um, and then finally it turns into the actual Eucharist, right? Um, and, and this scene is, is quite famous. So I actually wanna work through this passage or read it together. It's, it's quite long, but I'll say a little bit about this afterwards. Um, because it's, 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 it's super fascinating. This is a moment where Hadovic writes, then he gave himself to me in the shape of the sacrament, in its outward form, as the custom is. And then he gave me to drink from the chalice in the form and taste, as the custom is. After that, he came himself to me, took me entirely in his arms, and pressed me to him. All my members felt his in full felicity, in accordance with the desire of my heart and my humanity. I was outwardly satisfied and fully transported. Also then for a short while, I had the strength to bear this, but soon after a short time, I lost that manly <coughs> beauty outwardly in the sight of his form. I saw him completely come to naught and so fade and all at once dissolve that I could no longer distinguish him within me. Then it was to me as if we were one without difference. It was thus outwardly to see, taste, and feel, as one can outwardly taste, see, and feel in the reception of the outward sacrament, so can the beloved with the loved one each wholly receive the other in all full satisfaction of the sight, the hearing, and the passing away of one the other. After that, I remained in a passing away in my beloved so that I wholly melted away in him and nothing any longer remained to me of myself. So much is happening here. <laughs> uh, it's a fascinating, ecstatic moment. But I want to note a few things, um, one of which is this moment in the middle of this uh, particular passage where um, Hadovic notes that all at once um, dissolved that I could no longer distinguish him within me, right? This is one of the ways in which this uh, unitive moment of ecstasy is oftentimes described. I would also like to note, though, that this could very well be describing the very process of digestion, <laughs> right? Um, it, it is also maybe like a way of understanding, like you take in a bolus, then when does the food become a part of me or when is it separate, right? And then you excrete it. So there is this sort of like physical um, aspect of as well that is there. But of course, this has great theological meaning because ultimately what she wants to express is, first of all, that she has had this vision, right? And the vision itself is authorized, as I mentioned, by the fact that she sets up the context of the vision within her experience of the liturgy, right? And then what happens is she produces bodies, 
right, in this particular vision. As I mentioned, she writes that she herself, her body was aching because of her love sickness for God. She talks about her limbs, she talks about her bones, her veins, her heart, right? But then those bodies, both hers and Christ's body, they dissolve, right? So that's really fascinating, right? When they come together and there's no distinction between one and the other, we first of all see the dissolution of Christ's body, the disappearance of that body into Hadovic, and then the fact that she herself wholly melts away, right? So it's not only Christ that disappears and is dissolved, it's also herself, and that's a really fascinating move. I wanna mention um, a, a kind of theological move that we often think of as the oscillation between positive theology and negative theology, um, in which, most simplistically, positive theology posits what God is, right? Um, it is a saying of something. For example, God is good. Negative theology is to, to argue the, the opposite, right? That God is not good. But that does not mean, right, that God is evil. Negative theology is, in fact, suggesting that God cannot be contained by the term good, which is why we have to both produce a discourse about God, but then unsay it, right? So this oscillation between doing and undoing, saying and unsaying, is precisely what is being performed in this moment. Hadovic is saying and producing hers and Christ's body, and then she is unsaying and undoing it, right? And what is so important about this is that, you know, this, this of course has a lot to do with questions about authority over scriptural interpretation, teaching and preaching, right? Um, and the fact that the status of women and that, they, the, and that they were not given as much access to right, um, scriptural exegesis, this sort of production of her own text enables that kind of theological work. So in a certain way, the visions could be seen as an extension of the scripture or as parascriptural, so that she is producing her own text that is like scripture, upon which she can make an interpretation. Because if she offered an interpretation of the Bible itself, that could possibly get her into trouble, right? So this is a really interesting move that has to do with the authority um, and, 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 and gendered relationships of power. Um, so I want us to sort of hold on to that understanding of mystical ecstasy that we get in Hadovic, because of course, as I mentioned, Lacan and Bataille both read Hadovic. So the question that I have here is how exactly does what this 13th century mystic, what does she have to offer to our understanding of queer jouissance, right? Because it is not the case that someone like Bersani or someone like Ali Edelman, who also formulates a highly complicated notion of jouissance, are reading these mystics. But I am interested in the sort of implicit citation of Christian mysticism vis-a-vis -vis both Lacan and Bataille, because it is true that Bersani and Edelman are reading Bataille and Lacan. So this is a sort of question that I'm still sort of grappling with. Um, I want to turn finally then to a few comments about queer of color critique. Um, and I want to talk about uh, one version of this that is, uh, that is, ta that is called brown jouissance. Um, so in order to do this, let me return to some images because I think those are really helpful. Um, I want to basically talk a little bit about um, a an extension of the genealogy of the visual culture that I mentioned before, which is covers, um, book covers with images of Teresa on top. Um, because a number of other published works also cite f images that are clearly cit 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 citational of the Teresa moment, right? So for example, we have Peter Hujar's Orgasmic Man, um, a photograph from 1969. Um, in which we see something quite similar, right? Um, the intersection of what seems like possibly pleasure, possibly pain, possibly both of those things, right? It's the ambiguity, in fact, that enables us to think about this image um, in relationship to the Teresa image. Um, and this image, of course, is um, an image that m folks might know because of um, Hanya Yanagihara's novel, A Little Life, right? Um, uh, published in 2016. Um, has an in entirely interesting and fascinating huge queer fandom that I'm really interested in. Um, and so clearly there's also a kind of queerness that is attached to that image. And then we have another example here, 
um, Lyle Ashton Harris's Billy Number 21, in which Harris is dressed up, right, um, as Billy Holiday. Um, and then this image is used as the cover image for Amber Mooster's book, Sex Sensual Excess, Queer Femininity and Brown Jouissance, right? So the very citation, especially of Jouissance here, makes it almost explicit that um, the, the Harris photograph is being used by Mooser to cite this other sort of visual genealogy back to Teresa. So I'm sort of interested then in what Teresa can do for our understanding of queer of color critique. So what Hadovic's texts indicate then is that jouissance is but one moment that is grounded in the embodied and affect devotional practices cultivated in community. In other words, she offers a stark contrast, even a challenge, right, to Bersani's characterization of jouissance as solipsistic and antisocial. Um, interestingly, it is the site of queer color critique that seems to echo Hadovic's implicit formulation of jouissance. And what I mean here is that the vision themselves even, and the production of her poetry, clearly demonstrates Hadovic's investment in her Beguine community, right? So, so this sort of investment in community seems to be really distinct from the fact that Bersani, for example, is formulating something like an antisocial thesis. And in fact, what we get in Queer of Color Critique is maybe something closer or more akin to Hadovic's notion of jouissance or ecstasy. So in Amber Mooser's Sensual Excess, for example, we encounter a formulation of brown jouissance, which in contrast to an ecstasy that imagines transcending corporeality, is a reveling in fleshiness it's sensuous materiality <clears throat> that brings together pleasure and pain, once again. She goes on to suggest that, quote, brown jouissance emphasizes the production of selfhood in relation to the social, that it emphasizes the social relations at work in enfleshment, and that this form of jouissance foregrounds an intersectional analysis of subject formation. And Lyle Ashton Harris's Polaroid photograph, Billy Number 21, becomes emblematic, right, of this jouissance, as I mentioned. So as Musser explains, the self that Harris presents can be understood through the matrix of sovereign subjectivity. This is selfhood created in and through relationality with holiday. So in fact, that sovereign subjectivity is undone because of that relationality. Strikingly, Musser does not reference Bern Ber Bernini's Teresa, despite the significance of this image to the genealogy of Jouissant. However, Jose Esteban Munoz, um, another thinker in the tradition of queer of color critique, um, upon whose formulation of brown feeling Musser's text relies, does actually cite Teresa. So in his conclusion of his text, Cruising Utopia, titled Take Ecstasy With Me, um, and ecstasy in all of its sort of meanings there, <coughs> after the magnetic field song, Munoz calls for collective temporal distortion because individual transports are insufficient. So following a history of religion and philosophy, Munoz identifies in Teresa's chiseled rapture, an ecstasy that makes possible a stepping out of normative time. Ultimately, he asserts, knowing ecstasy is having a sense of timeliness's motion, comprehending a temporal unity, which includes the past, the having been, the future, the not yet, and the present, the making present. So this temporally calibrated idea of ecstasy contains the potential to help us encounter a queer temporality, a thing that is not the linearity that many of us have been calling straight time. And it is from a shared critical dis dissatisfaction we arrive at collective potentiality, right? So notice again his emphasis on the collective, the social, in contrast to Bersani's antisocialness. So while he most obviously is critiquing heteronormative or straight time and the individual forms of political action, Munoz's text in his turn in the end to Jouissance carries an implicit critique of the dominant reading of Jouissance found in queer theory's antisocial thesis. This is ultimately a critique of Bersani, sure, but more specifically Edelman, right? And, and this is something that I don't have time to go into, but um, again, another sort of complicated formulation of Jouissance. But interestingly, Munoz's reformulation of Jouissance comes closer to the notion of ecstasy in the Christian mystical tradition than Bersani's does, right? Even though Bersani is reading someone like Lacan and Bataille. <coughs> However, despite this conceptual proximity, he undercuts this closeness and in fact performs a kind of counter-identification with Christian mysticism when he claims queerness's time is the time of ecstasy, ecstasy is queerness's way, we know time through the field of the affective, and affect is tightly bound to temporality. 
but let us take ecstasy together as the magnetic fields request. That means going beyond the singular shattering that a version of Jouissant suggests or the transport of Christian rapture. But if Hadovic has taught us that the transport of Christian rapture is irreducible to a singular shattering of the self, right, in Jouissant, might it actually be possible to think Munoz's move as a kind of disidentification with the Christian tradition? And in fact, might we find in queer theory's disidentification with Christian mysticism something like a queer theology? And while these questions are some that I am currently exploring, um, but also require further exploration, I want to conclude by at least suggesting one shared textual strategy in mystical texts and the queer cultural products of artists, writers, and even theorists that we approach today. So as Hadovic and other pious women demonstrate, their texts attest to a debate over women's authorized access to scripture. And with this problem in mind, we might think, as I mentioned, of Hadovic's texts as parascriptural or extensions of scripture. And indeed, even the discursive production of her body in text enables her subsequent interpretive and theological moves. And this interpretation, in fact, resonates with the way that Treichler, with whom we began, describes the production of the male homosexual body. So she writes in that same essay, whatever else it may be, AIDS is a story, or multiple stories, read to a surprising extent from a text that does not exist, the body of the male homosexual. It is a text people so want, so need to read, that they have gone so far as to write it themselves, end quote. So it's the epidemic of signification that arises in tandem with the AIDS crisis, produces the male homosexual body as a text to be violently read, interpreted, diagnosed. Then perhaps we might think of the citations of mystical literature in queer art, literature, and theory as an attempt to rescue the queer body from the stranglehold of misconception. Thanks, everyone. So let's open it up to questions. Clarifying questions, anything. I'm happy so to have a discussion. I, I have a okay. question from the virtual audience. Of course, I, yeah, please. Um, would you comment on Ronald, uh, I'm sorry, Ronald Barth's take on mm -hmm. the pleasure of reading when he distinguished between sovereign pleasure and dissolving? Two songs, but also demonstrates their mm -hmm. inter animation in the act of reading the moment of interpretation. Yeah, definitely. This is a great question. Um, I don't know if I can answer all of that, but I will say a bit about Bart and his formulation of Jouissant, because it is true that um, we get, for example, a particular conception of Jouissant through the psychoanalytic tradition, which is the one that I was treating today. Um, Roland Bart gives us um, one that is not at least firmly grounded in psychoanalysis, um, but in his text, um, The Pleasure of the Text, um, he uses the term jouissance um, in opposition to the term plaisir. Um, so in translation, the, the opposition is oftentimes pleasure and bliss, um, although there are questions about whether or not bliss is, is too pleasurable, <laughs> um, is too sweet, for example. It doesn't really get at the sort of painful aspect of jouissance that I was also talking about. Um, and, and, and I will say that, um, one thing that is clear, I think, in The Pleasure of the Text is that this is not just a book that is a theory of um, textual interpretation. It seems also to be a text that is offering a kind of um, theory of sexuality as well, right? There's a kind of eroticism of engaging with reading and writing texts um, that I think is resonant with the eroticism that is part and parcel of the jouissance formulated by both Bataille um, and Lacan. Um, the other thing that I might say about the Bart is that um, Bart as well is uh, so not, I think, an explicit reader of Christian mystics, but Bart becomes extremely interested in monastic traditions um, in his later writings as well. And it becomes really clear the sort of emphasis on specifically idiosyncratic forms of, um, of, of monasticism. Um, are actually motivating um, some of the ways in which he understands um, one's relationship to the text. And so my, um, my inclination is also to think about this in dialogue with what's going on with Lacan at the same time. So yeah, thanks for sharing that, Sarah. Um, oh, we have a question in the back. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. Go ahead, yeah. Okay. So you talked a lot about Christianism. What about um, paganism, like shamanism or even ancient Greek stuff? 
Yeah, I mean, so I'll say that, um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm primarily interested in the Christian tradition here, but I'll also say too that a lot of what we get in the Christian mystical tradition is also coming out of um, the sort of the, the developments in Neoplatonism as well um, that are drawing from uh, certain ways of understanding contemplation, um, ecstasy, the beauty of forms, for example, that we see in Plato as well. So, so we do see a kind of transformation of the ways of understanding um, these particular kinds of ecstatic moments um, from, say, the ancient Greeks to Neoplatonists specifically. And I'm thinking here of Plotinus. Um, and Plotinus is sort of um, metaphysics deeply informs um, the, the longer tradition of Christian mysticism, for sure. Yeah. We had another uh, uh, question mm -hmm. from the our virtual audience. Yeah. Have you found anything related from Bridget of Sweet's mystical writings? That's a great question. Um, I actually haven't really explored Bridget as much. Um, I, I've mostly thought of Bridget in relationship to someone like Marjorie because of the emphasis on um, the kind of autobiographical in both of those, even though the term autobiography is really not super relevant in many ways for either of them. But I think the, the ways that their stories end up sort of um, sharing many um, narrative norms um, might actually speak to, once again, the ways in which textual production itself is so based on ritual performance, right? Um, the sort of deployment of tropes over and over again to present something like a pious or holy woman um, might itself be a kind of extension of the ways that I'm trying to think of, um, you know, ritual devotions, right? And one of the things that like one of my um, other projects is trying to think about is how in poetry especially, we might imagine the deployment of repetition, um, really broadly speaking, as itself a kind of um, trace of the iterative logic of repetition itself in ritual devotion. So that might be one way of, of approaching that question. Yeah, a very theoretical way of approaching that question, but at least one answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, you just make me think of so many things, but I'm going to try to yeah. condense this. Well, one thing in my head anyway, um, and I was wondering what you think about this is whether it's the self or with another person or whatever, is yeah. an, an essential element of this, I'm going to call it transcendence, and surrender. Like, and in this for an example in, yeah. you know, master disciple traditions yeah. in the East, you know, which I've studied, mm -hmm. the, the disciple who's just doing routine work, I mm -hmm. loved your, what you're saying about repetition and yeah. rituals, perfect. The routine, like sweeping the floor. The other guy yeah. who was reading the text, I'm going to be all, I'm going to be the big disciple. No, the guy who reached uh, enlightenment mm -hmm. was the guy doing the routine yeah. work. You know, so is it? Is, I mean, you know, I don't even know the question. But the thing about surrender. Yeah. Is that an element? Of the, you know. Yeah, definitely. In fact, so I want to say two. Could you repeat your question? Yes. <laughs> No, of course, yeah. So um, the question here has to do with, um, it's twofold it seems, one of which is um, whether or not there's an aspect of surrender to the type of experiences that I'm describing here. And then the other part of that, I think I was hearing you talk a little bit about just like menial tasks, right, the everyday. Um, and I want to sort of first just address that point really quickly because I, I, I would also say too that um, the sort of um, distinction between hierarchy, or rather the hierarchy between, um, say, the active life and the contemplative life is one, is, is that, that, that is a debate that, like, has, that, that, that has a long, long history. Um, whether or not like, it is important only to um, contemplate um, and be a disciple right, of Christ, um, or if you also have to do good works, right, as well. Um, and this is often told through the allegory of Martha and Mary um, receiving Christ. And so I, I mentioned this because I think that for me, it's also really fascinating that it's specifically um, figures of women who end up becoming um, rhetorically used to work out these theological questions, oftentimes by men, right? We see this not only with the debates over active and contemplative life, but we also see it with regards to, for example, the Song of Songs commentary tradition, which the figure of the female bride becomes a really important figure. But the question there is like, what's going on with gendered power, right? Like, why can someone like Bernard Clairvaux assume the position of the bride and what does, it, what does that mean? And when Hadevik assumes the position of the bride, what is, what is different about that, right? So that's one thing I'll say. The other thing about, um, about um, 
uh, oh gosh, what was the term that you used? You surrender, yes, sorry. So um, I think here about the significance of the term um, in Latin, affectus, um, which is translated as like affect or love. Um, that, that, that ends up becoming a really important term in the affective theological tradition. And um, one of the ways of understanding that term affectus is, um, if we think about that etymologically, um, ad facere, so to have something done unto oneself, right? Um, and so part of the ways in which um, these experiences end up becoming theorized is an opening of what's oneself up so as to um, be able to have something done by the grace of God, for example. So I think that's a, a largely a part, yeah, that's great, yeah. Um, I, have, I have another question. Sure. Yeah. The close relation between the erratic and the mystical has, of course, been well known for many centuries. Mm -hmm. How has the queer experience or understanding of this relation different from this? Is, how is it different from the straight? Mm -hmm. And has it anything to do with the fact that Jesus was the son and not the daughter? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Yeah. I, I would say that. Um, so return maybe, and to maybe make more explicit my question, or rather my intent in couching these questions within the historical context of the AIDS pandemic, um, one question that arises for me is what does it mean to seemingly um, laud something like an, a dissolving ecstasy when there are so many people who are actually dying, right? Um, so what is the sort of ethical implication of trying to formulate something like a positive ethic out of dissolution um, when like in literal terms, bodies are dissolving, right? Um, that, that's I think the, the, the ethical dilemma for me in some of these, these, uh, these, these attempts or these projects. The reason why, as I mentioned really early on in my talk, that I'm interested particularly in the intersection of pleasure and pain um, is because one of, I, ha I have a couple of worries about this, one of which is that pain will oftentimes be subsumed by pleasure, so that we like begin with this like acknowledgement that ecstasy is both pleasurable and, and painful, but then the painful just becomes pleasure, and so you sort of lose that aspect of it. And, and the worry about that is that that move can also obscure actual histories of violence or actual violence done upon bodies that are implicated in these spiritual traditions that are aiming for something like ecstasy. Um, and so that might be one way of responding to that. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Any final questions? Well, great. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate your attention. Um, thanks again.